hey, good morning, Hills Church. And it is so great to be with you this morning. We have a great morning. We're gonna celebrate all that God has done through Love the 50 this week and just praise him and thank him for his goodness together, amen? Come on, let's stand as we begin to worship. We're gonna sing a new song this morning. Sing it with me. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out. Why? 
never runs out. God, it's always constant, no matter our circumstance. God, you are greater. You are sovereign.
It's our anthem. It's our song for all eternity. Jesus Christ is Lord. You reign over everything, Jesus. Over fear, over death, over all anxiety. Jesus, you reign and you rule, and it's our joy to lift up your name today. It's our joy to lift up your name every day. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. Lord, we say we love you. We say today that you can have your way in every way. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Woo, y'all can be seated for just a second. Friends, welcome to church. How we doing today? Man, we are coming off the heels of an amazing, amazing week, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But before we do, I, I wanted to share an announcement, an important update with you guys uh, regarding a transition on our team. And man, a dear brother of mine, Christian, a friend of mine, I've known him for a long time. His family moved out here a couple years ago from Atlanta. And I can't say this more clearly or just more genuinely. God absolutely called him here for such a time as this. And we sent out an email this week, a video with Christian and I. It was on our, it went out Wednesday. It was part of the church news video. I would encourage you guys to check that out. But Ashley and Christian took some time to pray, took a little time away and to really seek God about their future. And they really feel like God has allowed them to start dreaming again and is even calling them into a new season where they can pursue some of those dreams. And when he came back from a little time off, he said, man, I think God has released me from my time here and is calling me into a new season. And I said, man, I'm always gonna be in your corner. We love you. I have nothing but the utmost respect for you and your family. And we wanna bless and honor Christian in this season of transition as he goes to pursue some things that God has put on his heart. And here's what I was reminded of in the conversation as this has been a conversation him and I have been having for a while. I was reminded that God brings people for specific seasons and specific reasons. And all throughout the New Testament, you see this. God would take Timothy to a city and move Barnabas or move Paul or move Peter for specific seasons and specific reasons. And I know this for a fact. God brought Christian and his family in one of the most difficult seasons of our church's history over the past year and a half through 2020. Not easy to transition a family across the country, much less enter into 2020. Come on, crazy, much so difficult, but he was the man for the job and he's been nothing but a blessing to this church. And I'm so grateful for the season that we had here. And one of the things that he said is, man, I'm fired up about the future of this church, excited about where the team is at. And I mean, let's give it up for this team. I know they've already gone off, but... He's done an amazing job building an incredible team. He said, man, the team's in good hands. I feel like I can move into what God is calling me into next with full assurance of what God is doing here. And I love that guy. I love his family. Want nothing but the best for them. And so as you guys see them around, around town, give them your love and be praying for them as they step into this next season. And if you want to share your love, just with a practical note, there is... Um, a way that you can send a note to him right here. Either drop it off at the front office or email him, email us in foot roll at hills.church and we'll get that passed along to him. But love him, love them, love their family and excited for their future. Um, that being said, Christian also said in the video, he said, man, I'm fired up about the future of this church. God is doing incredible things. And I, I don't say this lightly. I think this past week was maybe the most awesome week of my four years here at Hills Church. Hands down, one of the most incredible weeks. And we have a video capturing some of the highlights of Love the 50 Week. And if you were a part of it, you already know. But for those of you who didn't have the opportunity to serve this week, take a moment and check out this video.
this is it. just amazing and all of everybody who I mean came yesterday and today I mean this journey is is tough yeah. on a kid yeah. and he's gonna you know be spending a lot of time in his room and now he's got his dream room. Aww. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It's just perfect. Huh, it makes it a little bit easier. is absolutely amazing. As the slide said, over 650 of you jumped in to serve for Love the 50 Week, making an impact on our community for the love and glory of Jesus. And so just go ahead and give you guys a round of applause one more time. Come We're on. so proud of you. We're so thankful for you. Over 50 projects, nine cities, 2,300 man hours, again, to just glorify the name of Jesus in and around our community and show this community that we are for them, that we are for their flourishing and for their good. Absolutely unbelievable week. And it was crazy to me to think that last year there were about 270, 280 of you that helped us to see it double to 650. I was like, all right, Lord, this is like a movement now. This is becoming its own thing. And I just, I gotta give a shout out to Matt, to Kari, to their whole team. Yes. I don't even know if they're in here or where they're yes. at. But man, just so thankful for not just the leadership, but the volunteers who showed up, you who were the church. And thinking about just the last month, not just this moment, but the fact that our facility was open for a month to those victims of the Caldor Fire, to the fact that we stepped in and served nine different cities along the 50 corridor, just making a statement that the church is not a place, it's a people, Amen. and we're called to be a city on a hill, Hello Hills Church, that cannot be hidden. And friends, it's not just a name on the sign, it's who we are. It's who we are. And I'm so grateful for you guys, grateful to be a part of a generous church. And I will say one last thing. This is not just something we do once a year. It's not just something we do once a year. There are for the 50 projects happening all the time. And if you partnered with an organization, whether it was um, anything that we had, gosh, 50 plus, I don't even want to start to name them, right? Whatever, whoever you partnered with, if you want to continue to serve with them, by all means, there are opportunities throughout the year to continue doing that, to continue being the church going to be amazing. An That's incredible right. year. But next week, we have a fun week for you as well, Jonathan. What is happening next Sunday? This yes. has kind of been in the making for, I don't know, the last 25 years, but 25, also definitely in the next last who's couple counting, months. counting, right? Yes. Hey, next Sunday, mark your calendar, make plans. Don't go anywhere after church because we're going to feed you. We've got food trucks. We've got bounce houses. We've got a Ferris wheel. Praise Come God. On Come on, somebody. 
It's going to be awesome. Live music, picnic tables, just a chance for us to connect as a church family and celebrate 25 years at this amazing church of community impact, of all those sort of things. So invite a friend. Next Sunday is going to be an incredible time, and we don't want you to miss it. So please join us after church next week, 25-year anniversary also kind of a fall festival and just an overall good time. It's going to be so much fun. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be, be here. Awesome. Bring a friend. Love it. All right. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then we are going to jump into God's word together. So, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your faithfulness to this church. Thank you for what you continue to do in and through this church. Thank you for the amazing people who are Hills Church and Jesus, we ask, I pray today, Lord, that what you've started here would be just the beginning of the impact that we want to have, not just on the 50 corridor, but beyond and into the world for your name's sake and your glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen and amen. Okay, so today... We are continuing on in our series called The Next 25, where we are looking at who is Jesus calling us to be as a church, as his church, for the next 25 years. What does it look like for us to be the church in a season like this? I think we, we really nailed it this past week in terms of being the church and what that looks like, especially in terms of unleashing compassion, but there are a few things that Jesus said, I want my church to be this. There are a couple things in the New Testament where Jesus goes, hey, uh, this isn't optional. You've got to be this. If you want to be a house called by my name, the church of Jesus Christ, if you want to be the church, you have to be this. And I want to read for us a passage of scripture. There are a few times where Jesus got upset, like mad, got angry. Not often, but he did from time to time, and this is one of them. In Matthew 21, verse 12 to 14, and here's what happened. It says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves because they were taking advantage of the poor. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of, y'all reading along? Let's try that again. My house will be called a house of, but you are making it a den of robbers. Those, again, who were robbing and using the house of God for their own financial gain and to take advantage of the poor. Verse 14, it says, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, I love this, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. This is an incredible verse, an incredible passage about God's vision, Jesus' vision for his church. He said, my house, my church is going to be known for several things, but one of the things it's going to be known for is prayer. It's prayer. He goes, my house is going to be a house where the lame walk, the blind see, where healing happens, where salvation happens, but also it's going to be known as a place of prayer, a place where people interact with me, a place where people live lives of prayer. And today, the, the message title is simply this. I want to talk about this, the prayer that Jesus cannot resist. The prayer that Jesus cannot resist. How do we become a house of prayer and a people of prayer who pray in such a way that Jesus inclines his ear to us? What does it look like for us to become a house of prayer and a people of prayer? And here's what I know. If we choose to build according to Jesus' plan for his church, He's really good at building his church. He's been doing it for 2,000 years. It has transcended every culture and language barrier known to man. Billions of people have been gathered into his church. If we choose to build according to the plans of Jesus, guess what? It's gonna go well for us. It's his church. It's his blueprint. These are his plans. And so, friends, this is what we're going to do. But if I ask a simple question, what is prayer? 
What is prayer? Why would Jesus say, I want my house to be a house of prayer? Very simply, prayer is the means by which humans interact with God. Just gonna let that sit for a second. Prayer is the means by which humans interact with God. And it's really simple. And yet, let's be real, none of us do it. You can laugh, it's okay. I'm right there with you, okay? It's, prayer is hard. It's simple, but it's hard, isn't it? We're distracted. Where do we make the time? I, I don't know the right words to say. I'm not sure how to pray. I'm new to this whole thing. But Jesus changed the game when it came to our relationship and interaction with God. Think about this. In the Old Testament, in fact, I'm gonna read this from Hebrews 9 because it's just that important. It says this, listen to what it says about the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, about how people interacted with God. It says, now even the first covenant, that's the Old Covenant, had regulations. So people interacted with Jesus, with God, through regulations, through rituals, for worship, and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were a lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a tent, was a second section called the most holy place. Having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of of glory, overshadowing the the mercy seat. And of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. And so to interact with God in the old covenant was a big deal. One guy, once a year, the high priest, through a very specific set of rituals and regulations, could go into the presence of God. Nobody else could go in there. Nobody else had access to the presence of God. And Jesus came along. And there is this peculiar thing that happened the moment Jesus died. The moment he died, something happened. Listen to this, Matthew 27, verse 50 to 51. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. It's the moment of death for Christ. The moment he became the final sacrifice for sin. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. See what happened there? Jesus took the rules and the regulations. He took every barrier, every obstacle between us and God and he split it in two and he said, come on in. I've made a way through the sacrifice of my body and my blood for you to now have an all-access pass, a backstage pass to the presence of the Almighty. Come on, somebody. This is a big moment. This is a big deal. says this in Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence. Can you imagine the writer of Hebrews saying the word confidence? The Holy of Holies was the scariest place in the Old Testament. You don't have confidence when you walk in there. If you don't do it just right, you're dead. You're done. Imagine the writer of Hebrews saying, now we have confidence to come into the presence of God because of what Jesus did, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. That is through his flesh, through his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Friends, this is what Jesus has done for us. Now you have access anytime, anywhere. It's like Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman in John 4 when she says, you know, your people, the Jews, they say we can only worship on that mountain at the temple. Others say we should worship here. Where, where do we worship? And Jesus goes, hey, there's a day coming. You can worship anywhere. 
You can talk to God anywhere, anytime, any place. It's not gonna matter this mountain or that mountain because those who worship me will worship in spirit and truth. They'll worship me whenever and wherever they want because they'll have an all access pass to the Father. Jesus transitioned prayer from rituals and regulations to our Father. Whew. Can you even imagine this, this most holy place that can only be entered once a year by one guy through a, a series of rituals and regulations is now walking, now open to anyone who has faith in Christ to come into the presence of the Almighty and instead of in fear and trembling with just the right words and sacrifices and just the right clothing on, you can just come in and say, what's up, Dad? It's good to be here. It's awesome to be with you, Father. Jesus goes, you can talk to him like a dad because I'm gonna adopt you into the family by faith. All of you are gonna become my brothers and sisters and just like I talk to him as a father, now you get to talk to him as a father. Friends, this is what I know. Our relationship with God is not dependent on prayer. It's dependent on faith. You're saved by faith, but it will not grow without prayer. Your relationship with God, your intimacy with God, your, your walking with God, learning to listen to God, learning to follow the way of Christ, you will never become the person you are called to be unless you begin to develop a prayer life. You'll never enter into that. And friends, I'm preaching to myself today. I'm the pastor. I should be like a professional prayer. I'm not. I'm terrible at it. I get distracted, I get, you know, man, I start thinking about everything else. I, my prayer list turns into a to-do list over here on the side of what I gotta get done today. I'm 15 minutes in, I'm like, Lord, I'm bored. Is this, are you up there? Are you hearing me? All these sort of things. I mean, all the normal thoughts that hit every normal human being are my issues too. In the, in, in the essence of what does it mean to, to pray, to be with God? And here's what I know. I will not grow into who I'm called to be, not just as a pastor, but as a father, a friend, a husband, unless I choose to enter in and to fight for a healthy, vibrant prayer life. And so there's some things we need to know and remember if we wanna have a healthy and vibrant and growing prayer life, some things that I think will help us grow in prayer. Here's the first one. This will help us. Number one, Remember, prayer is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's not an obligation. It's a privilege. Jesus died on the cross and gave you an all-access pass so you can talk to God as a father. That's a privilege. And I think if we had faith and we understood what actually happened, what we now have access to, I don't think anything could stop us from praying. I don't think anything could stop us from wanting to be in the presence of our Father. Friends, prayer is a privilege. Jesus made a way, the veil is torn. And I thought about this because the disciples, they saw Jesus do everything. They saw Jesus raise the dead. They saw Jesus cast out demons. They saw Jesus heal the sick, heal the lame, heal the blind. They saw Jesus walk on water. And you know what they asked him? They had one request. This was the only time for Jesus to teach them something. They said, Jesus, uh, can you teach us how to pray? I think if I'm in their shoes, I'm like, hey, Jesus, prayer's awesome, but can you teach me how to walk on water? Like, awesome party trick. I would be so cool. Like, can you teach me how to turn water to wine? That was pretty awesome too. I think I'd make a bunch of new friends that way. I could even use it as an evangelism tool, Jesus. <laughs> Lord, teach me some of these cool things. No, but they came to him and they said, uh, can you teach us how to talk to God like you talk to God? That's all we want to know because we've heard you. We've seen you go off to desolate places. We've followed you and we've seen the connection, the relationship that you have with God and something is going on there that we want. Teach us to pray. And he did in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. That's a great place to start. But I think the first thing that we have to remember is prayer Prayer is not simply talking to God. 
but consciously entering his presence. But you think about that. Jesus tore the veil when he died on the cross and rose again so we could have access, not just to like throw some prayers like darts into heaven, hope you get this, Lord, but to be in his presence, to be with him. God wants relationship. He's wanted relationship since it was broken in the Garden of Eden. He wants us to be with him where he is. That's why he sent himself in the form of his son Jesus to be with us and restore relationship with him. And so prayer is about entering the presence of God. And here's the crazy thing. You can't hide from God. You can't run from God. Just read Psalm 139. I can go to the heavens, you are there. I can descend to the depths of the sea, you are there. Wherever I go, before a, before a word is formed on my lips, you know me completely. God is omnipresent. He's all-knowing. You can't hide from God. And, and here's the beautiful thing. Now you have access to him. Full access to his presence, which Acts 17 says, they sought after God, but he's not very far from any one of us. He's right here. Jesus said, I'll be with you always to the end of the age. So there's this crazy, insane reality. In the book of Ephesians, it says, we are seated with him in heavenly places spiritually. We are adopted and brought into the presence of God, but we're also here right now in this place. We have access to the throne through prayer, and we have access to him wherever, whenever, however. Just by consciously remembering the fact that, hey, when I talk to him, he's right here. He's in my presence and I'm in his presence. Prayer is about consciously remembering. You're not just sending words somewhere and hope, hoping they're heard. You're entering the presence of God. And you're talking to somebody as a father who is very near to you. Near to all of us. Prayer is so much more than just getting the words right. And friends, it's a gift. It's not an obligation. It's a gift. This past week, for the 50, I had the privilege, you guys saw it on the video a few minutes ago, such an awesome moment. Got to be a part of uh, building a room, redoing a room for this amazing young man, Austin, who is battling leukemia. Kind of one of those HGTV moments, move that bus, like he's gone for a couple days and then he comes back, he gives us the laundry list of what he wants in his ideal room because he's not able to leave his room very much. And it was so amazing working with the teams of volunteers to, to turn this place into something amazing and special for him, something that he would love, something that would just bring him joy every day. We got him a laptop so he could do his schoolwork. We got him all these different things that were just purely for him to enjoy, to bring some joy into his life. And, and watching him enter that room with his family for the first time, watching the tears that came to his eyes and the, the smile that came to his lips, I'm like, man, this is what it's all about right here. This is amazing, amazing. Now, can you imagine if Austin stepped into this room, his dream room, all the stuff he wanted, designed just like he wanted it, and he was like, hey, this is an awesome gift, uh, but I, you know what, I, I really like the kitchen. Uh, you know, the floor on the kitchen is just, I've been in the kitchen so much, I feel comfortable in the kitchen, I'm just gonna stay in the kitchen. In fact, I'm gonna sleep in the kitchen. I'm claiming the kitchen as my room. I wanna live in the kitchen. That room's awesome, it's my dream room, but I'm just gonna take the kitchen. Thank you guys for that gift, but... I don't think I'm gonna be spending much time in my room. No way, never. He would never do that. He's gonna be spending all of his time in that room. And friends, I was thinking about this, this incredible gift that we got to give him, and I think about, man, Jesus has prepared a place for you. He's made room for you to enter into a place where everything you've ever dreamed in the presence of God, everything you were created for is available to you. And so often we're like, ah, no thanks. I'll just sleep on the floor in the kitchen. We don't take him up on his offer to spend time with him. We don't enter into the privilege of prayer, into the space that God has made for us. Friends, prayer is a gift. It's not an obligation. God has prepared a place for us to meet with him, to be in his presence. And I wanna encourage us as a church, if we're gonna be a house of 
prayer for everyone, prayer begins with us. We have to become a praying people who see prayer not as an obligation, but as a privilege. So number one, prayer is a privilege. Number two, prayer is the secret sauce. It's the secret sauce. Here's what I mean by that. Well, I'll give you an example. Recently, I got introduced to something. I know, I feel like I talk about food a lot, but recently I got introduced to something called Dave's Gourmet Hot Sauce. Change your life right here. This will change your life. Prayer and Dave's Gourmet Hot Sauce will change your life. It's the secret sauce. I was at a friend's house and it was on top of whatever they cooked that night. And I was like, this is amazing. And he's like, yeah, the food's pretty good, but really it's the secret sauce. Dave's Gourmet Hot Sauce. And I was like, where do I get this stuff? All the stores are sold out. He's like, man, you can buy it in bulk on Amazon. I legit bought like two boxes of it on Amazon. And I put it on everything. I'm not even kidding you. I put it on, I'd put it on cereal. I haven't gone quite that far yet. But it is so good. It's a game changer. It makes everything better. Friends, prayer makes everything better. It's the secret sauce. It is literally the secret sauce to you, to you living in the will of God and walking out the Christian life. If we believed, if we knew it was available to us in prayer, we would never stop praying. Think about this. What does God offer you? Not just access to his presence. What does he offer us in prayer? Courage in the face of fear. Peace from anxiety. Cast your cares on me. Calm in the midst of the storm. Rest for the weary. Provision in times of need. Give us today our daily bread. Strength when you're feeling weak. Healing both physically and internally and emotionally. Wholeness from our trauma and our wounds. Wisdom when you don't know what to do. James says, anyone who asks wisdom, just ask the Father. He'll give it to you. Direction in life's hard decisions. Divine appointments seem to happen when you pray. I just speaking from experience. Comfort and company for those who are lonely, with a God who is always near. Hope in times of hopelessness, unending, unconditional love, the experience of that in prayer. He will never turn you away. He's never too busy. He never has an excuse for why he can't meet with you. Prayer is where we realize the forgiveness of God. Prayer is a place to be completely honest, completely loved, and completely known by God. It's a safe space. He's never surprised by you. He's never shocked by our brokenness. He gives us power to change in the place of prayer. Prayer is a place of transformation. It's power even to ask God to change the world, to change our nation. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray I would hear their requests and I would heal their land. Friends, prayer creates an atmosphere of faith, creates an atmosphere of need where God can move because God loves to show up in crazy ways. And when we become a people of prayer that just basically say, God, we need you, it creates an atmosphere of faith. It creates a kingdom come, your will be done reality that we all get to benefit from. If we knew that prayer really was the secret sauce, we'd put it on everything. Amen, somebody. On every situation, in every moment, every moment of the day, Lord, I'm coming to you with this. This definitely needs a little Dave's hot sauce right now. It's a pretty messed up situation. Can you please help? Can you make it better? Thought about, <laughs> we had a dog back in Atlanta years ago named Copper. And he was a trail dog. He was a big old golden doodle. He was crazy, crazy dog. And uh, took him on the trail, took him hiking one time with a buddy of mine, and he stepped on a thorn, a really huge thorn. And he was the sweetest dog of all time, big old sweet, happy copper. And I'll never forget trying to get this thorn out of his paw. I mean, he turned into a Rottweiler, pit bull, something or other. I mean, it was crazy. I, I had him on the leash. I brought him in close. And the moment I got my fingers in there to pull on that thorn, he's teeth bared, snarling, about to bite me. And then he runs off. I can't even catch him. I, you know, we had to corner him, get him down. My buddy Joel had to like hold his head back. And then I had to pull the thorn out. 
And I thought he was gonna kill me before I could get that thorn out. But if he just knew that he could come to me and it would hurt for a minute, but I could get the thorn out and then he could run and play and be free and not have any more pain, he probably just would have come to me in the first place. And so many of us so often, we have so much weight and sorrow and anxiety and hopelessness and fear and, and habitual sins and addictions in our life and it's causing us pain and it hurts and instead of running to God, we're running from him. We're not going to the place of healing. We're not turning to the one place who can heal us. And that brings me to this, the prayer that Jesus can't resist. The prayer that Jesus cannot resist. In Matthew 5, Matthew 6, I mean, verse 5 through 7, it says this. When you pray... Jesus is assuming that you're gonna pray. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the pagans do in their temples, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. I think the essence of what Jesus is teaching us about prayer right here is simply this. Don't bring what you think you should bring to God. Just bring who you are. Don't bring all the fancy words and the fancy clothes and all the fancy, beautiful prayers that you feel like church people should pray, just bring you. Just be real. Don't heap up empty phrases that aren't from your heart. You're in the presence of God anyways. He sees it all and knows it all. And I love what C.S. Lewis said, this beautiful quote. He says, in prayer, we lay before him, that's God, what is in us, not what ought to be in us. We lay before God what is actually there. We acknowledge that, God, I'm in your presence. You already know it. You already see it. Here I am, all of me. You know the prayers I think Jesus loves the most, the ones that he can't resist over and over again through the New Testament because he says, I didn't come to call the healthy. I came to call the sick, those who are in need of me. The only thing Jesus really wants from you is need a heart that says, I need you. I think one of the most beautiful prayers you can pray is three words. I'm pretty sure you can remember this. Jesus, help me. Change your life right there, I promise you. Jesus, help me right now. Jesus, I'm hurting. Jesus, I'm a mess. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I'm desperate for breakthrough in this area of my life or in this relationship. Jesus, can you make me whole? Are you willing to make me whole? And you'll be amazed to say, I'm willing Let's go on a journey together. Why do we avoid prayer? Why is prayer so hard for us? Because deep down, I think we're waiting for a moment, and I'll ask the band to come back out with this. Deep down, I think we're waiting to get our act together before we come to him. We're waiting to, to get our act together, to get cleaned up enough to go stand before our Father. We're waiting for this, this, the right time or the right feeling or the right words or whatever it is. And he's like, no, just come right now. Just come on. You don't gotta wait for the right moment. And I, I think about this, Romans 8, it says you've been adopted into God's family through faith in Christ. You're now sons and daughters of God, but so many of us live with an orphan mentality that maybe we've been abandoned, that maybe if we don't live up to God's expectations, he'll abandon us. I can't bring all this stuff to God. Maybe he won't love me anymore. Maybe he won't keep me as his son or daughter. Maybe he'll just leave and leave me. And we don't come to God as sons and daughters who no matter what we bring to him, he says, I see it and I know it anyways and I love you and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to stop that. Like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we try to hide from God. We avoid God. We stop going to church. We keep waiting to be in the right headspace or the right heart space to pray. And God's like, no, come right now as you are. Friends, don't miss this. 
this might be the most important thing I say, and I forgot to make a slide for it, but just listen close. Prayer is not a moment. This is what Jesus is saying in Matthew 6. Prayer is not a moment where you bring your best to God. It's an invitation from God to bring him your worst. Whew. It's not a moment where you bring your best to God. It's God saying, bring me your worst. Because when you bring your worst to God, it's an opportunity for God to say, see, I died for that. I love you. You're covered in grace right now. Let me heal you. Let me transform you. You're like, God, the thorn hurts. I'm a mess. I'm running away from you. I'm a broken man. I'm a broken woman. He's like, bring it to me. We may have to do a little heart surgery and there may be some pain involved, but at the end you'll be healed. Bring me your worst. Bring, bring me your need, he says. We gotta bring him our brokenness, our pain, our emptiness. Bring him all the junk in our life that we're too ashamed to bring to anyone else and bring it into the literal presence of God and experience in that moment what it feels like to be fully known by the most perfect and powerful being in the universe and in that moment completely covered, totally seen, embraced and loved by grace. That's why, friends, that's why prayer is not a moment to bring your best to God. It's an invitation from God to bring him your worst. You never, ever have to worry about appearances with God. You never have to worry about your appearance or how this is going to look to God when you bring it to him. We live in a culture that is obsessed with appearances. So I'll leave you with this. How do we become a house of prayer? How do we become a people who pray? A few just simple, practical things. Number one, pray often and honest about anything and everything and anywhere. Just bring it to him. While you're driving, on the way to work, on your lunch break, wherever you're at, just take it to him. Immediately take it to him and be real about where you're at. Invite him into the situation. Number two, Establish a rhythm and a habit of praying. It is also very helpful to say, hey, I know this moment every day is somewhat of an uninterrupted moment. Maybe it's in the morning. Maybe it's at night before bed. And I'm going to set aside some time and some space just to be in the presence of God. Maybe to read your Bible. And whenever you're reading the Bible, always be talking to God about it. Turn that into prayer. It's one of the best ways to pray. But set aside some time. Establish a rhythm and a habit to get this into your life. So not just often and honest and anything and everywhere, but a set rhythm and a time every day. And then number three, remember you're entering his presence, not just talking to a God who's far away. Every time you pray, you're consciously entering the presence of God, acknowledging the fact that he's here with you in this moment, that you're fully seen, fully loved. You can bring him your worst. You can bring him whatever you're going through. And if you want a good outline or a good diving board to jump into prayer, start with the Bible in Matthew 6, verse 5 to 15, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Just use it as an outline to pray. But friends, when we pray, God moves. When we express our need, God moves. Prayer is a privilege. It's not an obligation. Jesus has made a way for you to have an all-access pass to the presence of God. And if we knew what was available to us in prayer, you couldn't keep us from praying. And I'm preaching to myself today as well. We're going to close our time with communion this morning. And such a powerful reminder that Jesus' broken body and his shed blood, made a way for us to enter into the presence of God. Made a way for us to have an all-access pass to the presence of God and all that God offers us in and through prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you're here with us today. Jesus, thank you that you made a way for us to enter into the most holy place. Thank you that we're allowed to bring you our worst so that you can remove the thorns and you can heal us. Lord, we love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take communion together.
opportunity for us to bring our worst before God and to receive his mercies. Amen to that good news this morning. Hey, if you're new with us today, my name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here, and we just want to say welcome. Thank you for jumping over to Hills Church, for trusting us, for joining us online or on campus. If this is your first time, we want to get to know you. And so we invite you to connect with us at our info tents out on the patio. We've got a gift we'd love to get in your hands, and we'd love to get a little information so we can follow up with you and help a large church feel small for you. But hey, if this is your church home, I'd also love to remind and encourage you to continue stepping into moments and acts of generosity. Because of your tithes and your offerings, we were able to make weeks like Love the 50 happen with remarkable detail and compassion. And church, it's made possible by your uh, consistent uh, giving. And so there's multiple ways to do that. Throughout the lobby, we've got these wooden boxes, in fact, by the exits here as well. And then online, it's probably the easiest way that most people give today, you can visit us at hills.church slash give and set that up there as well. Hey, last things I want to mention, God has got fun things. I said fun, fun things happening this week. Our youth have a huge night coming this Wednesday. It's Youth Cella. If you're not sure what that is, welcome to the party, but be prayerful for our youth, for our young people in the work that God is continuing to do there. And I know this too, I know many groups are kicking off, like our marriage, our re-engaged marriage groups are kicking off this week. So if it's if it's you, if you're thinking, man, is it too late? It's not too late. Look online, find a way to jump in with your spouse. But church, would you stand so we could close in a word of communal prayer? And so, Lord, we do, we come before you, God, the close of our corporate time together, Lord, just so thankful that we have a God who desires a a conversation, a relationship with us. God, we count it a privilege to have access to your presence wherever we are. So, God, right now, Lord, would you just touch the, the depths of our hearts of those gathered the needs in this room and the needs outside this room. God, would you fuel us and equip us, God, to manifest love towards one another and towards those in need of that message of grace and love. We thank you for your time, Lord. It's in your name we pray together. All God's people said, amen. Hey, we love you guys. Say hello to someone in the lobby and we'll see you next week for the Grand Relaunch.